Hey, well, uh, if you have your Bibles, you can open them up, turn them on. We're going to be in John chapter 15 today, and we're ending out our Great I Am series. Today, we're going to be talking about Jesus as the true vine, and we're going to be engaging uh, just this reality of what it looks like to abide in Jesus. Now, uh, I want to take a minute as you open your Bible, you turn them on, you get into John chapter 15, and remind you that today is St. Patrick's Day. Amen? Anybody know this St. Patrick's Day? Now, uh, I know with St. Patrick's Day, uh, it, the color is green. Is that right? It's green? Okay, I wore yellow. Uh, it's close enough. I just, just want to remind you. A um, little bit of a rebel. But uh, one, one thing I love about St. Patrick is uh, what, what he did for the truth of the gospel. And, and so I just want to take a minute to share a little bit, and then we're going to open up with a prayer of St. Patrick as we get into the Word today. But I don't know if you know, but... Uh, his story ends up in this uniquely uh, weird kind of kind of way. Uh, he he starts uh, kidnapped by pirates at the age of sixteen, taken to Britain from Ireland, sold into slavery. Uh, he spends six years as a shepherd there, and according to Thomas Cahill, he had two constant companions, and they were nakedness and hunger. It was under those harsh circumstances that Saint Patrick. Learn this, pray in all situations. One night he heard a mysterious voice telling him that it was time to leave Ireland and to walk to a seaport. Miraculously, as he was walking to the seaport, he found passage away from Ireland and back to Britain. Because of his captivity, St. Patrick missed any kind of formal education, and later he spent time training for the priesthood. But he lacked any kind of classical training or theological training. So he found himself returning to Ireland and taking time to grow and become a priest and giving literally years to school. After growing up in that, uh, he felt called back to his captors, to the Druidic shamans and pagan kings, and said, if God could rescue me out of it to teach me, then he might be sending me back to teach them. St. Patrick had a unique belief. He believed this, all the world belongs to God. Can I get an amen? amen? And that became part of the power of his prayer life. He had a confidence in God. It was legendary. He would, he would literally teach through nature the goodness of God. It's where we get the idea of the three-leaf clover and the teaching of the Trinity. He had he had this unparalleled ability to connect the word of God with the truth of what he was seeing. And so today, I just want to take a moment to pray a shortened version of St. Patrick's breastplate prayer as we get into the word of God. Would you bow your heads with me? It goes like this. Christ with me, Christ before me. Christ behind me, Christ in me. Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left. Christ, when I lie down and when I sit up, Christ, when I arise, Christ, in the heart of every man who thinks of me and in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me, Christ, in every eye that sees me, Christ, in every ear that hears me. In Christ's name we pray, and everyone said, amen. amen. So today we're going to be in John 15, and we're going to be reading this story about a gardener and a garden, fruit and the vine, abiding in Jesus. And I can't get ready to tell you this story without giving you kind of a placement of where it happened. So this is only recorded in the Gospel of John, and Jesus is about to be betrayed by Judas. Actually, Judas has already left to carry out this evil work, as we saw in John 13, 30. So Jesus begins to teach his disciples in Jerusalem before he's gonna cross the Kindred Valley and enter back onto the Mount of Olives. Now, uh, I, I wanna take a moment because uh, I think it's at this time that I should share an embarrassing story about myself. Uh, I, I, I wanna say this. Um, I, I'm a very confident person. Uh, right, Pastor Joel? Very confident person. But even confident people do really dumb things sometimes, right? Right? Wives, don't elbow your husband right now. Um, 
But I remember before I was a pastor, I was selling insurance. I know, pray for me, insurance salesman turned pastor. Glory of God, right? Can I get an amen? Uh, but I was selling insurance, and I was selling insurance to a developer. Uh, you, you might have heard of them, KB Homes, and, and they were developing a community. And, and I was so confident coming in. I knew I was going to get this policy, and I was going to be able to write uh, for the insurance, the, the, the property and casualty insurance, of about 500 homes, right? I was I was already thinking about the bonus check that was going to come with it. My confidence was soaring. So I walk in the room and uh, my clothes are right, no wrinkles. I'm feeling good. I've lint checked. I, I get into the uh, model home and I begin this conversation with the developer. Everything's going so good. And then I had that moment where I realized that I didn't have that much of a dinner last night and I'd skip breakfast out of my excitement. And anybody ever had this happen in the middle of an amazing and good God thing, your tummy just begins to rumble. And there I was standing there thinking to myself about breakfast. All I could think about was breakfast burritos and how they're a gift from God and what kind of breakfast burrito I would get in the moment. My mind drifting off of this opportunity with this developer. And so I see in my line sight this huge bowl of fruit sitting on the table. And everybody knows that fruit is good for you and a banana in the morning is a gift. And so I look over and I, I think to myself, you know what, this conversation is going so well, it's in the back. I have it. I reach over to grab a piece of fruit out of the fruit basket and take the biggest bite that I could into this delicious apple that was in there. And wouldn't you know that I bit into a piece of fake fruit. You know how embarrassing it is to try to be selling somebody insurance and you bite into a piece of styrofoam in front of them? <laughs> I learned a valuable lesson that day. Not all fruit is real fruit. I learned a valuable lesson that day. Sometimes people make something look nutritious that's not. I learned a valuable lesson that day. Not everything that I think is good is really good. So let's jump straight into the scripture. John chapter 15, verses one through 17. It goes like this. I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I also will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burn. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit. Showing yourselves to be what? My disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in the, his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made complete. My command is this, love one another as I have loved you. Now we get one of the most Famous scriptures right here in verse 13. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and do what? Bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. So here's the big idea for today. We can only bear the fruit of the Spirit by abiding in the true vine. We can only bear the fruit of the Spirit by abiding in 
the true vine. Here's the danger. There are many kinds of fruit. And the kind of fruit that Jesus is talking about here is fruit that only the Spirit of God can produce in us through abiding in Christ Jesus. See, the definition of abiding is to accept or to act in accordance with. You cannot expect to feel near to God or God's will if you are abiding in everything other than Jesus. Can I get an amen this morning? See, I so often meet people that tell me, Pastor Sean, I feel far from God. I don't hear God's voice. I don't feel like God loves me or is near me. And I ask them, what are you abiding in? What are you spending time in? What are you engaging in? See, Jesus reminds us that if we abide in him, meaning that we abide in his word, we abide in worship, we abide in uh, being around people that are in him, that he will be in us and we will live for him. And so when we find ourselves not living for Christ, we must ask how much time are we actually spending with Jesus? Are we eating fake fruit? Now here's what I want to do today. I want to kind of walk through this scripture and I want to help you begin to understand what it looks like to abide in Christ and to let God's love flow through you. Number one is this, it starts with a desire to know. A desire to know. See, knowing Jesus and knowing about Jesus are not the same thing. Knowing Jesus and knowing about Jesus are not the same thing. Let me give you an example. I am a die-hard Los Angeles Lakers fan. That's where you're supposed to clap, just as loud as you can. Yeah, there you go. All right. Man, what a crowd this morning. My goodness. People were clapping online. Um, I, I was literally a Los Angeles Lakers fan when Robert Sacker was our starting center. If you know anything about sports, that was a very bad year. But I didn't jump ship. I didn't go to any other team. I am a Los Angeles Lakers fan. I'm a Los Angeles Lakers fan when they play well, and I'm a Los Angeles Lakers fan when they play like they are this season. Somebody needs to call a prayer meeting for the Lakers. Thank you, Jesus. But, but here's the reality. As a Lakers fan, I know everything about Kobe Bryant. I mean, everything. I actually remember the day that I found out that Kobe Bryant died. I was preaching here on this stage. I got a news alert. And when I walked off of the stage, my phone began to blow up. And somebody walked up to me, one of the brothers in our congregation, and he told me, Sean, Kobe died. And I thought, what kind of sick, cruel joke would you play on a man of God as I'm walking off this stage telling me this? Little did I know this was a true reality. Now, I know everything about Kobe. I had his very first card. You know, his very first card when he was a rookie was a tearaway tops card that Subway had. I don't even like Subway. I went to Subway. I ordered a foot long just for Kobe Bryant. I know everything about him. Everything. I know all his shoes. I know, I know how many points he scored when he was wearing them. I know everything about Kobe, but I, I don't know Kobe Bryant. I, I never knew Kobe Bryant. I had seen him. I'd been close to him. I'd heard him bounce a basketball. I'd heard him talk. I've heard about what kind of father he was, what kind of husband he was, good and bad in his life. I knew all about him, but I didn't know him. And I think one of the dangers of the generation that we live in is that we know all about Jesus, but we have no desire to really know Jesus. See, Matthew 7, 21 through 23 says this, that there are true and false disciples. I, I, I shared this last week. Uh, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And I will tell them plainly, my God, listen to this. I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. There were people in Jesus' day and there are people today who think they are friends of God because they do things in his name, but they desire not to be God's friend and abide in him. They, they abide in everything but God and then try to use his power and authority to get what they want from him. 
Let me tell you, knowing about God and knowing God are not the same thing. You have to have a desire to know, meaning this, that you desire to learn about Jesus, not because I'm preaching him to you, but because you love him and you desire to know him. A desire for his word, a desire for worship, a desire for his presence, a desire to see him change other people like he's changed you. This is what it looks like to abide in Christ. Come on, somebody, there has to be a desire to know him. But there also needs to be a connection to love. See, it's, it's not enough to know Jesus because what happens is when, when you get to know Jesus, you get to know power and you get to know authority and you get to know opportunity, but it's got to be connected to love. It's got to be connected to love. Why? Because Jesus says, this is my command to you. Love one another. Love each other. Listen, Christians, we can be doing all of these religious things and hate everyone around us, be nothing like Jesus, and that's not abiding in him. There are many people that do many religious acts and and great things in the name of God, and they treat other people like garbage. Now, now let me uh, encourage you. None, None of us is perfect at loving our neighbors. All of us pray for patience and then God brings that annoying person into our life. It's like you say amen and they poof, show up. Because God wants you to practice what you preach. Oh, just me. Okay, it's just me this morning. See, Matthew 22, Mark 12, Luke 10 all remind us that the greatest commandment is to love God with what? Your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. But then also, also church, Love your neighbor as yourself. What, what, what does it look like to love your neighbor as yourself? How are you doing at loving your neighbor as yourself? You know, when they park in your parking spot or playing loud music on a Saturday night and they're partying and you're, you're just waiting to party on Sunday morning because you're following Jesus and you're like, I'm trying to get, that's just me. I'm just venting right now. I love you guys. But I want to remind you that it needs to be connected to love. I, I remember one time I was going to preach at a church, and I'm not going to name the church. It's a, it's a large Spanish-speaking church in Orange County, thousands of members. And I was going to preach on a Sunday, and uh, I, I'd been practicing because, uh, you know, I was, I was not using a translator that morning, and my Spanish is terrible, let me tell you. Sounds like a four-year-old trying to speak Spanish. <laughs> And, and, and I'm practicing and I'm looking through my notes and I'm pouring over it and pouring over it and pouring over it and I'm in the car and, and I had that moment, you ever been in the car and you're so focused on something else that you zone out a little bit? And I was going slow on the, on the on-ramp from the 605 to the 405 and this guy comes around me going probably 80 miles an hour and almost cuts me off the road and kills me. If you've seen, there's an embankment that goes down the side into the river and I thought to myself, I almost just lost my life right now and literally as I'm I'm trying to slow down the car and and pull it over at a safe stop I look over and the guy flips me the bird and I'm like I love you Jesus I worship and adore you I'm looking at him like I'm not gonna do it not gonna do it fists on the wheel because I'm saved but sometimes my hands act like they're not And, and I'm sitting there and I'm like, God, please, Lord, give me the strength not to do anything. And I'm, my energy is going up and, and my heart is beating fast. And I'm like, God, what just happened right now? I collect myself. I'm like, I got to get to there and preach. And I get to the church and guess who's standing at the front door? <laughs> standing at the front door to usher me into the church. I, I looked at him and, and this man got red as a ripe tomato. And, and, and I wanted to say so many things, but I just walked by and I said, good morning, brother, love you. <laughs> Bet that heart was convicted, can I get an amen? See, there needs to be a connection to love. You could greet everyone. You could pretend like you're a Christian. You could stand at the front door. You could do many things for Jesus. But then when you go out and you flip people off because they got in your way for a second because you were too busy to love people, my God. See, what what happens is when there's a connection to love, there's an energy to service. And and not just service uh, to do things, to do good things, but to do things to glorify Christ. See, what we live is not just service, but Christian service. 
Can I, can I say that means that babies matter more than animals to us as Christians? I, I, I've got to say things like that. Now, now I'm not going to get political from the platform, but we need to have these conversations. Animals are creation, and yes, we could argue whether or not they have a soul. I don't think so. And if they're going to go to heaven, and, and Pookie's going to be there with you, your little cat that you had for 23 years. But I know this, a child is born with the image of God. They are an image bearer, the Imago Dei. And we need to love, and we need to serve them. And let's not drive by the homeless in our city while our cats are fat and happy. See, Christian energy is showing hospitality to strangers, Hebrews 13. Remembering those in prison, Matthew 25. Uh, can, I, can I stop for a second and remind you that the largest church plant that Light and Life has ever planted was a lifer in prison, Brian Worth. God used him in a powerful way. Actually, my grandmother, his wife, and the mayor of Paramount got 50,000 signatures to get him out of prison. It stirred the hearts of a board, and he got out of that sentence and is now planting churches with multiple campuses, reaching people for Jesus. When you remember people with love and you serve them, God changes things. Providing for the needy, Matthew 25, mentoring others, Titus 2. This should be our daily living, caring for children, tending to families, treating employees fairly, dealing honestly with customers, being diligent with our employer's resources. As long as it's done by Jesus' name and according to his will and is motivated by the love of Jesus, it is Christian service. And it lives out Colossians 1, expanding the gospel about the earth. See, we have to have a faith and love relationship, a faith and love relationship with Jesus. See, here's the danger is we can easily substitute religion for a real relationship with Jesus. We can often think that if we're doing Christian things, that it all counts. But counts to what? The Bible says everyone falls short of the glory of God. When, when you count it all up, you know what Paul says? Filthy rags. All your righteousness, all your glory, all those people you preach to, Sean, it means nothing if you don't love Christ when you wake up in the morning. It means nothing if you don't worship God in spirit and in truth. It's not what we do for God, it's what we do with God. Can I get an amen? See, here's the danger. You have to really check whether your heart is centered on performance or production. Performance or production. Here's, here's an example is, um, we are super lazy and comfortable as American Christians. I'll just let that sit for a second. Lazy and comfortable. You know how I know we're lazy and comfortable? Because we do everything we can not to be inconvenienced by anything. You know how I know that? I love fruit. Anybody in here love fruit? I love all kinds of fruit, guava, papaya, watermelon, bananas, apples, oranges, strawberries, blackberries, blueberries. I could go all day. I love fruit. And most of our fruit has been genetically bred not to have seeds in it. You know why? Because seeds slow us down. Do you know that? Do you know that bananas used to have a bunch of seeds in them? Ugh. I mean, could you imagine biting into a banana and you have to spit out seeds every time you bite into that banana? No, I'm going for the seedless watermelon. Thank you, Jesus. But our fruit's like that a lot, isn't it? Quickly produced, done in Jesus' name, but the seed of the gospel not present at the center. It, it might nourish for a moment, Meaning people get emotional and they get excited and it moves them for 15 seconds and then what happens? They come off of that high and they've got nothing inside of it that can reproduce what they just experienced. We take the seed of the gospel out of the work of Jesus and we wonder why a generation is fading away from him. We fill stadiums but we don't teach people how to be disciples. We pray for people in a moment but we don't teach them how to pray. 
Family, I want to encourage you that the Christian life is not just about performing, it's about production. And it's not just about production, it's about reproduction. Can I get an amen? You know what the first commandment was to men and women? Be fruitful and what? Multiply. You know, Jesus reiterates the same thing when he sends you on mission. He says, go and make what? disciples, spiritual sons and daughters, teach them to obey my commandments, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Listen, if we get big rooms filled with comfy Christians that sing songs that they love and wait for Jesus to come back, we are not being fruitful by the truth of the gospel. We must reproduce. We must see the world come to Christ. For every person that's in here that has an amazing glory story about how God pulled you out of, somebody should be shouting hallelujah right now. He's pulled you out of the pit. He's changed your life. He's given you a testimony. You know you are not who you were before you met Jesus. But how many people need what you have? Yet we pull the seeds out because it's inconvenient. We'd rather just worship songs that we love. We'd rather just sit and not serve We trade reproduction for performance. See, you can't do work for Jesus without Jesus. If there's anything that we learn from this scripture, it is simply this truth. You can't do work for Jesus without Jesus. Christianity is, is not an adaptation you take on to match your environment. It is not a language that you learn. It is not Spanish or Japanese or Hebrew or Greek. It is what you become when you die to yourself and you become a new creation in Christ. When you're saved, you are changed. You are in this world, but you are no longer of this world. That's that's conditioning, not change. That's behavior modification when you say, I'm just gonna talk like a Christian, walk like a Christian, dress, I don't even know what it means to dress like a Christian. That's behavior modification. What we're looking for is spiritual transformation. What we're looking for is testimony. Because we are saved by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. When I meet people, you know what I wanna hear? I wanna hear, I once was, now I'm. I once was angry, but now the Lord has given me peace. I once was bitter, but now I experience the joy of the Lord. I once was in a cult, but now I preach the truth of the gospel. I once was in the streets, but now God is pulling people off the streets into the church. Do you have a, I once was, now I'm? Uh, Maybe you've just been around Jesus. Maybe you've just been calling yourself a Christian. But we don't call ourselves Christians. We become Christians. We die to ourselves. We become alive in Christ. And many people in this generation are trying to do good things without recognition and submission to the God that made this world and that is the light of the world. We must realize that our desire to do good can never exclude the only one who actually is good. Or what we perceive as good is actually one of the worst things that we can do. So I wanna challenge you today. I really wanna challenge you. And I'm not challenging you because it's in my outline. I am stirred in my very soul, my heart, my mind, and my strength. Family, are you bearing fruit that will last are the seeds of the gospel at the center of everything you teach from your life can people taste and see that the lord is good does does your ability to live out your christianity end when you walk off this parking lot or does it become stronger because you were centered in community and now you can go feed a dying world What do your relationships look like the more you invest in them? That's something to really check, like, am I a follower of Jesus? I met a lot of people like, no, I follow Jesus, I'm a religious person. And I see them destroying the lives of the people that get closest to them. 
Jesus doesn't want any poisonous, toxic fruit on his tree. He wants people that are submitted to him, dying to themselves, and becoming alive to the goodness of God. What are, what are the outcomes of the people that are spending more time in your presence? Because you can't give what you don't have. And if you're not spending time in the presence of God, then the people spending time in your presence won't be experiencing God. They'll learn holy words and it'll fade away when you're not there. Are you discipling? Are you leading? Are you mentoring? Are you, are you raising up in Christ? Are you teaching like the apostle Paul did? Follow me as I follow Christ. Are you bearing fruit that will last? Would you bow your heads with me this morning? I wanna encourage you that nobody's perfect, yet everyone needs to be directed. And the more that we submit, the more attached to the vine we can become, the more we can abide when we quiet and we silence the flesh that lives within us. The more we die to ourselves, the more alive in Jesus we become. And if you're sitting today listening to this message, whether online or on site, maybe you're in this building and you're thinking to yourself, Pastor Sean, man, I am convicted and I don't think I have that. And I might be like that usher. I don't know that I can really live out what I've been hearing without anybody looking around. Here's what I want to ask. If that's you and you want to commit your life to follow Jesus, if you want to commit to regrow and to a rebirth, to let the seed of the gospel form in you that you might be able to share the truth of God with others, that, that maybe you've had a St. Patrick-like opportunity to serve God. People have hurt you and, and they've done evil things to you, but, but you don't wanna repay it. You wanna learn and you wanna grow and you want love. If that's you and you wanna commit your life to Christ without anyone looking around, I just wanna ask you to slip up your hand wherever you are. I wanna, yeah, yeah that right there, right there, right there, right there, up there. Thank you, Jesus. I've seen like five or six hands go up. You can put your hand down. I, I wanna encourage you, there are gifted prayer intercessors at the cross. Brother John, Sister Terry Ann, Daniel, others, Charles is back there. I wanna encourage you, don't, don't leave this place without praying with somebody that has been where you wanna be, that has done what you desire to do today to give your life holy and fully to Jesus. I did that in January of 2008. My life has never been the same, not perfect, but directed and bearing fruit in the name of Jesus. For the rest of us, um, I'll, I wanna take a moment to challenge you. Um, gossip, slander, anger, bitterness, resentment, fear mongering, worry, those things are not fruit that will last. They're not fruit that will last. They're, they're things that manipulate and, and try to make us look better than we really are. And, and I wanna lean on John Wesley, one of the founding fathers of our faith for a moment. How have you made yourself this week look better than you really are? Maybe you've done something like even pick fruit off somebody else's tree and staple it to yours or pretended you were growing something that you're not, or produced something without any kind of seed of the truth of the gospel in it. If you can think of anything in your life, I know I was so convicted writing this message. I was thinking of all the people that I gotta talk to, that I gotta confess to. I called one of my mentors late last night and said, I, I just need help with this, help me with this. These are things that that I'm doing and bearing that are not of the Lord. We all have these things. Everyone falls short of the glory of God. There's no shame in identifying the brokenness of your life, but, but if you wanna give that up, die to yourself, continue to produce new and beautiful things through being restored, revived, and renewed in Jesus, then without anyone looking around, just raise your hand up with mine, whatever it is unforgiveness, a slip of the tongue, a burst of anger. I wanna remind you that, that 
God wants to treat you today like I treated that usher. I love you. Love you, brother. Love you, sister. I love you, son. I love you, daughter. God is not so angry with you that he desires to leave you or forsake you. The promise is this. Abide in him. He will abide in you. And you will bear much fruit. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, for this opportunity to be vulnerable and honest, to pour out our soul to you, God. It's this way that we begin to serve. God, we cannot serve unless we submit. And so as we submit the things that are in us that are not of you, Lord, we ask that you would grow and shape us into the people that you want us to be. God, that we would not desire to grow so fast that we miss the seed that can be carried on to plant a new tree. God, that, that we, don't, we don't desire to grow so quickly, Lord God, that we never become ripe and, and, and Lord, that people never taste and see your goodness. Lord, Lord, we desire, God, not to fall from the tree, but to be connected, never to be a branch that withers away, but, but to be connected to the very tree of life. For you are healing for the nations. For you are our sustainer. For you are what keeps us and guides us to eternity. God, we wanna give it all to you, everything, as we die to ourselves and become alive in you. I wanna end by restating St. Patrick's prayer over you. Christ with us, Christ before us. Christ behind us and Christ in us. Christ beneath us and above us. Christ on our left. Christ on our right. Christ when we lie down. Christ when we sit up. Christ when we arise. Christ in the heart of every person who thinks of us. Christ in the mouth of anyone who speaks of us. Christ in the eye of all that see us. Christ in every ear that hears us. Jesus Christ, we have come to give you glory and honor through submission and service. Abide in us and us in you. Bear much fruit in us through the power of your spirit and all of God's people said, amen. Can we give God a hand clap of praise this morning?